so thanks very much, Brendan, and thanks for, for inviting me down. Uh, delighted to be back in Cavan. Um, I'm going to talk about photography today, which is my main area of interest. Um, and as Brendan mentioned, I curated an exhibition last year in the National Museum of Ireland with my, Brendan Malone. And um, we wanted to look at the museum's collection of photography and we wanted to examine how photography was received and used during this period. Um, and the National Museum of Ireland has a great collection of photographs, but a lot of them are in albums. A lot of them are a little blurry. They didn't know how to show them necessarily before, pre-digitization. Um, so this is the main image that we used in the exhibition. And it's um, taken by Joseph Lawless in Rath internment camp. Um, and it was taken using a very small Kodak Vest pocket camera, which he was able to conceal. So this is taken um, in 1920, 21. Um, Rath internment camp uh, was near the Curra, um, and he was able to take these photographs without the people uh, who were running the camp knowing. Um, and it's very much in the style of uh, a snapshot photograph. And we chose this to be the key image for the exhibition because we said, thought it said a lot about photography. It said a lot about you know surveillance and being watched and being been looked at. Um, so in this photograph you can see a Sergeant Roper of the Black Watch. Um, you can also see another inmate from the uh, Curra and then Joseph Lawless was taking this photograph himself. Now Lawless had a long history of using photography. He was active in 1916. He was at the Ashburn ambush um, and he actually took photographs of that and after he was captured he or just before he was captured he left his camera uh, a rifle in a wall up beside Ashburn. Then he went back to get it, but the rifle was there, but the camera wasn't. And he mentions this in his Bureau um, of Military Hi History witness statement. And this is great for a photo historian to be able to get somebody talking about the camera, the exact model that he used. And this is the model that he used. Um, and they were the, sort of like the iPhone of their day. Um, <clears throat> very compact, very well designed. And either he would have held it here, down here, or held it lower down, but he was able to conceal it. And this vest camera thing was, that's where you were meant to put it. Um, so for the exhibition, Brenda and I actually bought uh, one of these on eBay. They sold very well, so you can still get them for relatively inexpensively. Um, but as I say, very dinky, very small. Um, and the album that Joseph Lawless created of his time in Rath internment camp uh, gives a view of what life was like for the prisoners. It's very personalised. His edition as well, his edition or his, um, his vest pocket camera had this little feature where it had a pen at the side and you could scratch into the um, negative and you can see here and say what, what, what it was so that you had this sort of record as it went along. These images are very stark. So this is actually from their queuing up to go to mass. So other things that are covered by him during um, this period are recreation, drama, um, some of the inmates had TB. Um, then there's also this whole sort of imagery of comradeship. So it's the friendships and the learning. And you find this through Republican history and through this period as well. You know, often putting a lot of people together um, really sort of feeds what they, you know, what their mindset is, what they want to think about, what they talk about. They're educating each other. Um, and the sort of friendships and comradeship that are formed during this are in some ways strengthen their belief in their cause. They're very evocative photographs. And previously these wouldn't have been shown. This is a very small album. These wouldn't have been shown because for some curators previously, um, they were a little bit blurred, obviously because of the way that they were taken and the fact that they were taken serendipitously. So they're a little bit blurred. So, and also they had to be digitized. How do you display an album? Because you can only have one page open. So this is what digitization has opened up for, opened up for us. Uh, so we've displayed them within the exhibition, which is on for the next two years at Collins Barracks. Um, we've displayed them, we scanned them and then enlarged them and you can see much more detail. What we also wanted to keep was the captions and perhaps the narrative within the album, what sequence the images were in, which tells a story in and of itself. So this is another one. This is, this is also, you know, you really get this sort of 
swagger, personality, friendship, um, what it was like to be in there. And, you know, you really get this feeling of um, them, all being in it, them all being in it together. You also see how makeshift some of the buildings were. And when you hear and read about the tuberculosis and maybe the health problems that some people have, you can totally understand it from this. Um, and we're very lucky. Joseph Lawless donated this um, album to the museum in 1950. So I'm quite interested in the idea of when does something come into a museum? Why do people hold on to it for a certain amount of time? Um, and he's, he gave, some people give a lot of details when they denote something, some people don't give anything. He left quite a good background statement. So he said for this image that um, Sergeant Roper heard the snap and he heard the click and he asked around what was happening and he just hung back. And then he was saying that, you know, he knew it's process of identification. He would be afraid then that he might be identified. How can that image be used? And this is what I'm interested in about photography, not just necessarily what's in the image, but how was it, con how were they consumed? How did people encounter these images? What were they used for? You know, is identification an important factor in this particular photograph um, and in others that we'll see? So again, there's a certain type of swagger that you don't necessarily get with the studio photograph, with this sort of snapshot, um, this attitude in this photograph, definitely. So the next image, you know, just to give a little forewarning, is a little bit harsher. And this is a photograph of, um, you may have heard of the Loch Nan brothers. Um, a lot of the photographs that I'm showing today actually happen to have been taken around October 1920, 1920 or 21. So we're coming up on that 100 years or 103 years and the same time of year. So this is a photograph of um, the bodies of Patrick and Henry uh, Harry Lachlan, and um, they were picked up by Black and Tans and tortured um, on the 26th of November 1920. Um, their bodies were found near Gort. Um, they'd been taken away, tortured, dragged um, along. Their bodies were burnt, and then they were put in a near found in a nearby stream. And these photographs were taken by a local photographer or a local teacher who was also a photographer, Tomas O'Hagan. And um, they really are testimony of what has happened. Um, and I think what I, what I find fascinating about them is that the sort of, it is the, the body within the community. So this is like photography as evidence. These are the sort of things that are kept and are circulated to say, look what's happened here. The people who were, who were purportedly did this um, were brought in front of a sort of court martial type thing, but found not guilty and nothing happened to them. It is said that these were published, um, myself and another colleague, uh, Fiona Lachnan, who teaches in the National College of Art and Design, she's undertaken quite a lot of research into this. We haven't been able to find them published anywhere, either in Europe, America or Ireland. So we're beginning to think that maybe they were reproduced and circulated. And whilst I was putting on the exhibition, somebody came in who was from Gort and his father said that he had seen them in a house in Gort uh, at the back of an album, that type of thing. So, what, was, what, what happened to them, but they're used really as evidence and as testimony. There's different versions of these. There are some in the Pyrrhus Beasley papers, which are in the National Library of Ireland. There are some in the UCD. Um, so they were in circulation, but again, it's within the community. These were young men. It's, you know, there's quite a detailed testimony, as again, you know, the Bureau of Military History has brought up um, a wealth of information where you can find the backstory on these photographs. Um, and they're spoken of, you know, we're talking about martyrdom, they're spoken of nearly in those terms. Their sister um, ended up becoming a nun. She speaks about their bodies in a sort of relig quasi-religious way. Um, but they probably are, and when we, within the exhibition, we decided to segment these and keep them separate to the main, so to give people the choice, a little warning saying, do you want to go into this space? You have the choice to, if you don't want to. But, I think not including them would be in some ways skirting around or ignoring the fact that this is, this is what violence against the body looks like. So some of these photographs, by the nature of this actual era, are, are, are not necessarily that easy to look at. But the majority, I suppose, are more militaristic. They're more people in uniforms. That's what we're more used to seeing. Um, but a very valuable piece of testimony. And then also something very strongly 
evokes community and evokes that feeling of these were pe these young men were part of that community. Um, so not that easy to look at, but an interesting phenomenal that also Thomas O'Hagan went about seven or eight years later back to the site and took some very evocative photographs of the place where they were found and they're in NUIG Galway, as it now is called. They're in their collection um, and they're worth looking at as well because they're like a landscape photograph, but it really is like a pilgrimage or a return to the place where this happened. Um, so the next photograph as well is something that's pretty hard to look at. And again, we're talking in and around the same time period this is all happening at. Um, and this photograph is taken of Terence McSweeney days before his death in Brixton Prison on the 25th of October 1920. This came into the museum in 1937. Um, what that time lag says, or has time passed where people no longer feel that this is as potent, or they feel that now it's safe to donate something, is worth thinking about how this was taken again. Technology has enabled this, because if you think of most older cameras, you're talking about a tripod, you're talking about a longer exposure time. So this was also taken with a snapshot. It's blurred by its very nature. And I think it reveals the harrowing nature of a hunger strike. Um, it's also somebody within his circle has taken this, and this didn't see the light of day. Now, he went on to have a very elaborate funerals, multiple funerals, and much has been written about the um, notion of spectacle. And now his funeral in London, and then when he returned to Ireland, how both of those were filmed on Pathé News, how they were recorded. Um, but there's something very haunting about this. Again, a very small image, um, a snapshot, slightly blurred, but a piece of testimony and a piece of a record of where that was at or what that was like. Um, and again, we think it was taken with somebody who snuck in. So we're, we're talking about, you know, taking photographs that you're not supposed to be taking. Um, this is a better known photograph. And uh, if we're thinking of, you know, today's contemporary current affairs and the notion of fake news, there's nothing new in the world. The idea of fake news is something that, um, you know, has always been there. Is a photograph real? So this is supposed to be the battle of Kerry, um, and it's in a magazine called The Graphic, um, and it's talking about really the, what we're talking about here is state organized propaganda. So in 1920, the British authorities commissioned and published fake photographs of an alleged battle at Tralee, County Kerry, which resulted in significant success for the Crown forces. So there was a Hugh Pollard and Captain, brilliantly named William Darling, were involved with staging this battle, which was staged in Kalini, Kalini County, Dublin. And how this was discovered was an Irish independent, or a, new, a newspaper journalist saw, um, what well, saw the um, street lights in the background, and he went, we they, yeah, he was from, he was from Tralee where it was supposed to have happened. He goes, we don't have them, that is not there. So that was the sort of hint. They also made footage, so the people playing both sides are British soldiers, and then this was circulated, and then how it's captions, what happens to that information, how do you know who's in anything? So really this has a resonance for us today and how we read media, how we think about media. And then if something goes out into circulation, how do you pull that back? How do you redress that? Um, and to think that they went, that this moving footage as well, the Pate, Pate News footage, how elaborate that sort of hoax was and how many people were in on it. Um, <coughs> but all fake and really it's this, these light lamp posts as well. Um, and the idea of filming it now in Kalini, just, it just seems quite, quite at odds. Uh, but there you are. And you know, I, I, I like to look at how an image is presented. You know, what is it captioned? What are the captions? What do the captions tell you to think about an image? Um, and we're moving into an era. If you think of earlier wars, it wasn't until 1890 that you could really properly produce image and text on a page that was photographic. Up until the 1890s, before the half-tone printing process, you would have a lithograph or a woodcut based on a photograph, but it wouldn't look like a photograph. So it would have that remove. It wouldn't be exactly like a photograph, or else you would, if you wanted a photograph in a book, you'd have to stick it in and print one for every edition. 
So this sort of conflict, we're moving into a more visual record of conflict. We're moving into something where the imagery is carrying a lot of the message. And, you know, some of these, some of these images are, um, you know, in mass circulation. How do you pull that back when something gets out there? So the next image is perhaps the only other one that I probably should give a slight, a slight bit of a warning about. Um, and this is a photograph um, that appeared in the Freeman's Journal um, of a young man called Arthur Quirk. Um, and he was picked up um, by the Black and Tans, brought to Portobello, uh, Portobello um, and he was kept overnight and tortured. So, the complexity of the scenario in Dublin during this period of the 1920s is demonstrated by the fact that he interacted with three different police forces. So there are three different aspects of police forces. He has the Dublin Metropolitan Police, there's also the British Army proper, and then there the auxiliaries are black and tans. Now in his statement he says that the black and tans are the ones who tortured him. He was kept overnight. Um, he had sh shots fired beside his ears. He was beaten with the butt of a rifle. Um, he worked in the publishers Brown and Nolan. He'd gone to UCD. Uh, he'd gone to boarding school. Um, he was from Wexford. So this is a bit like citizen journalism to some extent. When he got out, he was, and his final, he, they moved him from Portobello on to the Bridewell, and he was dealing with the Dublin Militra, Mil, Metropolitan Police and the Bridewell, and he felt that they treated him very well. That was a different type of interaction. Then they let him out. But after that, he went to the uh, Freeman's Journal, and they said, well, we are going to take a photograph of this beating that you had. They also brought on board... Um, the chief medical officer of Dublin, um, and he cooperated and said, this, these injuries happened and this is what I think happened. Um, so this is a very complicated, but a very interesting case. And if you can see here on the text, you can see how densely printed the Freeman's Journal was. This was a big newspaper and you can see it's not, new, images are still quite rare. He had the cop on or he had the, the you know, he was, he was not charged with anything, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't kept in, but he, he said, I want this recorded, I'm going to go. And perhaps because he was working in publishing, he knew the people to go to and he went to the Freeman's Journal and he had the photograph taken by the press photographer, Daniel Craig, and, um, who also did some alterations on it, which I will talk about as well. So when you're getting into, if you tidy something up to be printed, does that change the nature? How much have you changed the image? And is that changing its um, entire message? Or is that changing the, it's changing the photographic object to such an extent that it becomes something different? Um, what makes this case particularly interesting is that um, at this time, the defences against the Realm Act, which was enacted during World War I, had been extended to Ireland which meant that you couldn't really report as you wanted on certain things. And in this case, the editors of the Freeman's Journal ended up being arrested, brought to court, um, and they were unusually court-martialed, even though they weren't military. And the evidence was given, and they said, this is true. The medical officer came along. They said, this man probably was beaten up. This man was but they were charged with causing dis disaffection, which was sort of like bad morale. You know, it's like an extension of that sort of thing. So they were fined and they went to prison. So it makes it a, a very compelling case. It was also discussed in the House of Commons and it was discussed in the House of Commons with the um, Chief Justice of Ireland at the time, or um, Hammer Greenwood, uh, also Bonner Law got in on the act as well. He spoke about it as well. And they actually used the word faked photography, fake news. So really we're talking about a very early example of that sort of distortion. Um, they also said, oh, well, he's in with the media. He would know what to do. He got them to do this, you know. So what can be believe, believed, what can't be believed. But it's quite an early example of that idea of you know, using a photograph to give a demonstration of state-sponsored violence and then it being refuted at a very high level. Um, the following year, the photograph was reproduced in the American Commission on Conditions in Ireland, which was an interim report on injustices in Ireland during the period. Um, and I like to compare the two captions as such um, 
because they tell a different story. They're used in a different language. In this one, you know, it says Mr. Blank. He's anonymized within this. He's not given his name. He was brutally beaten by black and tan cadets while a prisoner in Portobello Barracks. Now, the American Commission on Conditions in Ireland, their interim report, it took witness statements. It came over to Ireland and it also met in America. Um, it used photography quite heavily, photographs from press agencies. This is the only photograph of violence against somebody or you know, its impact upon the body. Um, so it's, their caption is a bit more, it's more in a legalistic, more in a sort of courtroom type setting. So they're saying, exhibit and then the number, lacerated back of a youth flogged by cadets while a prisoner at Portobello Barracks, Dublin, um, for publishing the photograph without permission of the Imperial Army Authority. And you can see the use of language, how they view the English forces in Ireland, how they view the state. Um, the editor was sentenced to two years imprisonment by a military tribunal. You'll also see that there's been a sort of simplification of the image here. Perhaps some of the stuff has been, you know, we don't have the background. We don't really get a little glimpse of the context. You can sort of feel that this is a barrack store or that's within that. Within this, it's been simplified. Um, this this um, actual document was widely circulated and used a bit like you imagine a UN report would be used or used like that. It was viewed to, by some to be far too lenient and representing only one side. Um, but it still had a kernel of truth in it as well. I suppose it also shows up the inadequacies of the halftone printing process in that we can't really see what's going on there. We're used to much more clear images. Um, but what it does show is how a photograph can move into a different realm and how it's reproduced. It was reproduced along with very different sort of material. Um, and you don't consume an image or look at an image in isolation. What's also on this page is, it's the day before Terence McSweeney dies. So you've got that in. Does the other, fo other stories that you read heighten how you, response, you respond to this? The other things within it is, um, there's mention of the burning of band and there's mention of um, different price rises, there is mention of an O. Henry story, his latest story. So you're, I think when you're analysing media or when you're looking at that, you have to look at the whole thing. What is the ad beside it? If I read a story about Terence McSweeney before, does this influence how I feel about that? Um, so it's not really, if you extract the image and remove it from it, the context in which it's read and the overall editorial bias of a newspaper, you're getting the whole picture. And I suppose that is media studies or sort of visual culture analysis. So this is an album which is uh, also created during the same period during the War of Independence and it was created by um, uh, an, an IRA group who were charged with intelligence gather, gathering. Um, it's a loose leaf album which has uh, about 66 pages in it and what it has is a variety of photographs some of them are from society magazines, some of them are from the newspaper, some of them are from photo studios, um, and it's coupled with these quite detailed notes, often that are based on surveillance. Um, so what we're talking about is recognition, identification, but also the mixture of image and text. So some of these images aren't really that outstanding or that interesting, but when they're put together with names, when they're put together with addresses, and what we see with a lot of the images and text within this is that it's a combination of extreme watching. So we're talking about people's, you know, their gait, what their disposition is like, what sort of clothes they wear when they're not in uniform, where they go, where they eat, they're being watched. Um, how were these photographs attained? How did people get their hands on them? You know, what did it mean to have this album? If you were caught with this album, it would be very serious. But then also, if you were in the album, it's also very serious. So for some intent, for some purposes within this, these, uh, this album is being used as a means to identifying somebody pre-assassination 
or it's being used to identify somebody that may be favorably disposed towards the IRA, or it may be identified, you know, there's words like tout, there's words within it um, that are very damaging. And you can see within here, Pather Clancy's murder is there. Um, the murder gang, you know, there's a, quite a heated and lengthy discussion about the murder gang stroke Cairo gang. Why were they called that? You know, who did they kill? Um, did they meet at the Cairo restaurant or did they serve in Cairo? Um, some people pop up again. So this will give you another indication of the type of photographs that are in it. Um, so I've written a quite a lengthy essay about this um, because I find it completely fascinating, um, this idea of people being watched and also what use normal or regular family photographs can be put to. Um, they think, and if you, the, again, going back to the Bureau of Military History statements, you find evidence of certain photo studios in the city being amenable to the IRA's cause or being, you know, somewhere where people from Dublin Castle went to have their photograph taken. But if you have somebody working in the dark room in there, they were going, copy for them, for their official gazetteer, copy for you, here's his name, that's his address, that's where they live. And much of this evidence ga gathering and intelligence gathering was undertaken by you know, Irish people who are working in the civil service. And, you know, if you look at the concept of the greening of Dublin Castle, the greening of the civil service, um, the idea, and we've, you know, he will see a certain amalgam within the Michael Collins movie of Broy, where you have somebody who is a trusted functionary within the civil service, who is, you know, on, for all intents and purposes, appeals to be somebody who's, you know, a safe pair of hands as regards to official secrets, but who is, you know, double agent or whatever. Also, what you have is, you know, people in restaurants, people in bars, people in boarding houses who notice things and pass things along. Um, throughout this, throughout this um, album, we have very neat handwriting, very much details. Some of the pages there's one particular image has up on 70 people in it, and opposite that they're all numbered, and opposite it has, you know, this man wears a grey suit when not in uniform, this person has a nervous disposition, this person has green eyes, this person walks with that particular gait. Um, and then other people they list who are working in jobs like, you know, the doorkeeper, the, the, the person who offloads things, this caretaker, you know, and they're... You know, we don't know what the oral commentary that went with that, whether some of them were um, going to be of help. So one particular person who's identified within it is Lily Mernon, who was working in Dublin Castle, and some of you may have heard of um, her story, whereby she was working um, in a division within Dublin Castle. Um, she was involved in everything. She was, you know, organising, you know, um, social nights and she was asking people where they were going and what they were doing and that sort of thing in a chatty, friendly way. And this was all passed on. Oh, but she brought out documents, crossed the city and tram, typed them up and then brought them back. This is on our lunch break. Um, she was related to Pyrrhus Beasley. So there's an overlap in some of these pictures as well. There's obviously duplicates of them because some of them are turning up in different collections. Um, some of them are annotated in different collections and some of them aren't. I really like family photographs and the idea of a studio photograph being created for, you know, to give to your friends and family to mark a particular occasion. There's something, you know, quite strong and quite compelling of the idea than that being appropriated by somebody else. In some of these, you have an X over people's heads, you know. So it's a big amalgam of a lot of different types of photographs which take on a different meaning when they're put together with this information which people have gleaned from watching people or from being on the inside of something. Um, you can see there that woman there, you know, on the page opposite it will say that, you know, she's, uh, you know, an associate of such and such. She tells such and such this, you know, that sort of idea. Um, and also, perhaps much of the commentary that goes with this was, could have been verbal. We don't know, and that it was only passed on. And you will see traces within the um, witness statements of, you know, there was a raid, I moved this material, you know, that sort of thing. So there's one particular quote, it's um, Charlie Dalton, and this is, uh, he was part of this intelligence 
group, this intelligence group, and he's saying, I, Charlie Dalton, was told to cut out any paragraphs referring to the personnel of the RIC or military, such as transfers, their movement socially, attendance at wedding receptions, garden parties, etc. These I pasted onto cards, which were sent to the Director of Intelligence for his perusal and instructions. Photographs and other data, which were or might be of interest, were cut out and put away. We often gathered useful information of the movements of important enemy enemy personages in this matter. So this is not an ad hoc sort of thing, you know, this is very much organized and in a way it can be viewed as using the police's own methods against them. So it's a sort of counter surveillance, a counter insurgency um, and a very, you know, unusual and hard to dissect use of photography. So these images alone mean nothing without the text. You, you wouldn't be able to decide, why are they all together? What is this? So it's sort of like a distorted family album in some ways. So you may have seen this photograph before and within the room that, of the exhibition where the post-mortem photographs are, we sort of have divided them up into images such as the Loch Nan one, which are very raw and very um, much visceral showing the impact of violence and then there are very formal laid in state photographs um, which we would probably all be familiar with and if you think even of Eamon de Valera lying in state and there is that sort of tr there is that transition where the body moves from being part of the family's remit to becoming a public remit where people visit it and you know it's dressed so this is somewhere in between so this is Michael Collins laid out at St. Vincent's Hospital, Dublin, before his removal to City Hall in August 1922. And I think it, it's a very intimate photograph. You know, it has some of the trappings of being laid out in the rights of the Catholic Church and that, but it's still just one step away from his actual death in that, you know, the boots, you can see the mud on them. He has the, the still is the bandage on his head. Um, it's a little bit more... Um, like something you would see in a domestic setting. Um, and there's something very touching, but it's slightly haunting. Again, because of the nature and how these photographs are taken, they're a little bit more blurred. They're not as crisp as the photographs taken by the press photographers. They're not going to have that sort of um, perfect crisp image, but they are atmospheric and they really are something that brings us very close to that moment. Uh, so, Within the exhibition, so I, I was trying to do the other sections that we had within it were um, propaganda, the photograph and print, um, that idea of how you encounter photographs at different times and why they're used in a different way. Um, and within these, many of these had not been exhibited before because they're sort of hard to exhibit when they're in a tiny little album. And also some of them aren't photographically the crispest or the best quality but they, what they are doing is bringing you very close to the event. This is another image that is probably better known. It shows Michael Collins um, lying in state in City Hall uh, in August 1922, and his brother is um, visibly moved there, you can see. Uh, but it's a much more formal image in some ways, and we have, it's sort of been elevated. It's got the same trappings, and it's got the same concept, but now we're talking about this is purely for public consumption. Um, and if you think, you know, really this is, it's open to everybody. And in a way, this has got a tradition that is quite strong in Ireland. And if you think of the hunger strikes uh, in the 1980s, if you think of that sort of idea where the photographs move, or the body moves into being the community's possession in some ways. Um, but this is, you know, this is something for everybody. And, and in a way, that person's sacrifice comes to symbolise the cause. Um, and within this series of photographs of Michael Collins, this is probably the one that has the most personal and touching impact among it, amongst, very well constructed if you're looking at it from a photograph point of view. And I suppose the actual layout lends itself to that graphic imagery. Um, but a very sad, poignant, poignant moment. Uh, again, there's the candles in the background, you know. So we really are looking at um, when a body moves from being the family's remit, moves from being, you know, and 
I was recently at a conference on uh, the body in modern Ireland and death in modern Ireland, and there were quite a few questions asked of one of the keynote speakers about Queen Elizabeth's the process around that and how the body wasn't shown and how some people expected that. And if you look at some other, you know, state leaders and when it, when is the body shown and when isn't it? And how is photography used then to circulate and to get that image out there? So this is an image um, of the funeral processions of executed Republicans. Um, so, you know, this is, this is actually one of the captions that probably caused quite a few um, responses in that the word execution or state assassination, which do you use? And we're getting into, within the Civil War, we're getting into something entirely different here. So this is like after the period and these people were killed by the state and it's showing a state, you know, a sort of a people's response to that. It also has a sort of Victorian feel to it. It has that... Um, atmospheric sort of throwback. Um, and this reinterment re 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 and that idea of where people are put and where their body ends up and how is the photograph used in this process, the photograph of funerals. And I think perhaps with COVID and with that, the recording or the actual taking pho of photographs, we've probably shifted a little bit with that in that it's probably slightly more acceptable than it was. but within this collection, it is a recurring theme. Now, also, if you're thinking about photo photography on this period, you have to think what isn't covered. And because of the nature of a national museum or a state museum, what do people donate? People donate things from their side when their side is in government. So you're gonna have a sort of hiatus up until 1932. You're going to have people, I don't recognize the state. I don't want to give the state my things. I don't want to donate. Then you also have um, really got a gap then in the other side, you know. And I'd like to, within the death room, as we were calling it, um, include, you know, what about the bodies of World War I soldiers who were dying during this period? Of course, I mentioned uh, previously Dora, the Defence Against the Realm Act, which precluded soldiers, sir tried to prevent soldiers from taking photographs, but you're not going to continue to take photographs of bodies whilst you're still trying to recruit. And they're invisible. You know, we do not see those photographs of men in the trenches at that period. What did people see then? What photographs they, did they see? They probably saw at the beginning, there were attempts to have a photograph in the newspaper of every soldier that was dying, but that was soon overwhelming. And what would you have is a PALS type photograph where two buddies go in and get their photographs taken in uniform before they head off, or you've got the family's last photograph. Um, but you're not going, you're not seeing, because it's bad for morale and that act that I mentioned, which was extended in Ireland um, because of the unrest and the war of independence, you're not going to see photographs. So that's one absence. Um, and it's only recently that World War I has become something that people are, you know, going, oh, I have that photograph at home. I'm going to, I'm going to share it. And then, Violence against women is something that is also not covered within the collection. And this is not saying it's not happening, but what you have is who is going to find that photograph in their family and then go, I have this, I'm associated with this, because it's not really the same as saying, look, I was a victim of this. It's a slightly different thing. How close were you to this and why did that happen? So you sort of have to acknowledge the, those absences. What was photographed? What wasn't photographed? Why did people pick up a camera? Or, you know, they're picking up cameras now as well because they're easy to pick up, they're smaller. Um, but in some areas, they're not able to do it. They're not able to do it at all. Um, and the reproduction of these images, if you look at how the photographs of the 1916 leaders and those who were killed during it were mass reproduced, mass reproduced and put on postcards and mimicked mass cards that were used in a personal family setting how they went around and how that, knowing what somebody looked like, you know, does that change how you feel about them? Does that make it more real? Does it make it more personal? So we've put a lot of examples of that into the exhibition. Um, but then you always have to be mindful of the fact of what, what isn't covered. When do people not bring something forward? Or when do people are too traumatized? And also the warning and, you know, there's, 
there's quite a lot of discussion. I was at uh, an event in the Royal Irish Academy during the week talking about trigger warnings and risky objects. And do you remove them or do you discuss them, um, give people a pre-warning? Or is there a cons- uh, possibility of re-traumatising people with PTSD if they see something, even though it pertains to a different conflict or something like that? Um, but I think what we tried to do within the exhibition was give a bit of balance and actually show people images that weren't necessarily the ones that were widely in circulation. And I know that as we're coming to the end of the decade of centenary, um, the use of photography uh, is something that I would feel pretty strongly about. I would be very keen that photographs are captioned. Who took it? Where did it come from? What collection is it in? If known, what process did it use? where did you first see that photograph? So there's a lot of things that may be called photographic histories, but are really just an illustrated book, but don't really discuss why did the photograph, is it in that process? Why is it taken from that angle? Um, you know, why is it blurred? You know, all of these, in, you know, an- analyzing a photograph as you would any other primary source that's telling a photo, that's telling a histori- historical period and showing it up. Um, so I think that's about it. This is one of my favourite images because I think it really does bring back that collective idea of grief and it also shows a, a Dublin tradition of following the hearse to Glasnevin and the crowds that are there. Um, you know, it's the, con- very, the context of it really tells a, a pretty strong and still quite, as we found out, a debated and contested story. I think that's it.